What is up, everybody? Welcome. It is Sunday. It is the best day of the week. We are so excited to hang out with you guys today. If you haven't noticed, it looks a little bit different. We're changing things for the next several weeks because we just want Sundays to be even better than they were before. We believe, even though we're online, we can still connect, still engage with each other. So let's do this. Speaking of that, uh, well, before I, sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. My name is Mikey. It's nice to meet you. If we do not know each other, um, I'm one of the student pastors here at Community. I just want to welcome you to our service. Um, but here's what I want you to do. We have the chat section that is going on right now. And every service, I'm going to kick things off with a chat question. And here's my question for you today. And I want you to answer um, the most creative way that you can. All right. I am a huge fan of soda. Now, my favorite soda is Coke Zero. Now, I know it's weird. I know some of you are like, bro, anything other than regular Coke is weird. Don't do it. Diet uh, or caffeine caffeine free. I don't know why you'd want to do that. Coke Zero. Now here's the deal. Growing up in my house, we never had regular Coke because my dad couldn't have it. Health issues. Long story. Whatever. Coke Zero. My favorite Coke. But here's my question. They have all sorts of crazy flavors. If you could invent any flavor of Coca-Cola, what flavor would you go for? Would you go cherry? Uh, sorry, uh, something other than cherry, something other than vanilla. Those have already been created. I think even orange exists. My vote would be, I don't know, like coffee or like dark chocolate would be kind of cool like weird but kind of cool maybe bacon flavored i love bacon things i don't know i have some friends over here what do you guys say what do you think pickles. pick pickles like dill pickle coca-cola okay what else corn on the cob. what corn on the, corn on the cob strawberry Ooh, i love strawberry anything strawberry flavored corn on the cob corn on the cob doesn't even have like a distinct flavor i don't know who said that who said that? Sam. Come on, Sam. Corner of the cop. Anyways, let us know in the chat section what you guys think about your favorite Coke flavor. If you could invent one right now, what would it be? Um, we got some good contenders, but I don't know. Corner of the Cobb seems like it might be on the lower end of the list. No offense, bud. Um, anyway, so we hope you guys are doing well today. What you're going to experience, you will experience. We're going to play a game together, um, or you're going to watch us play a game, um, I should say. And we're going to have worship together. We're going to have a lesson today. And of course, we have our life groups that will be taking place. If it's your first time, we want to welcome you. Um, if you kind of just need to know more about who we are, you can text the number in our description and just say, hey, I'm new and we'll help you out. We'll hook you up. We'll get you to the right place. So you know exactly what you're doing and where you are going. So we're going to play a game. Um, and my good friend Sam is going to come up because the next couple weeks, I'm going to play a game called Mikey Battles People. Now, Sam, we're not actually battling. So before you get excited that you get to like hit me, that's not going to happen. Okay. Here, come on this side of that microphone so it doesn't block you. We want to be able to see you, my friend. Okay. Right, let's go. But here's the deal. We're going to battle and we're going to do battles in different ways. Today's battle is very unique. M let me ask you this question, Sam. First of all, how are you doing? I'm pretty good. What would you say the color of your shirt is? Um, light blue. Light blue. Good choice. Izod? Yeah. Good quality. Appreciate that. So we're going to go, we're going to go battle. Do you think you could beat me? Uh, yeah. You don't even know what we're playing, but you think you could beat me. Exactly. Bro. That's the story of Sam's life. Sam is like always looking for somebody to defeat in some type of competition, but you're friendly about it. It's kind of confusing. Exactly, bro. It's fine. After you beat the person, you say Jesus loves you. Oh, that's how that works. Okay. Glad you heard it here first. You beat somebody and then Jesus loves you. There you go. Um, so we're going to play a game today. And this game actually comes from me being a father to Olivia. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. It no involves a children's here. book, okay? Oh. Here's how this game came about. Actually, Tara and I played this game. I'm not even joking. not even making this up. We played this game um, one night. Uh, Olivia had already gone to bed, and I guess we were so tired that we began to get a little delusional. That's kind of what happens when you become a parent of a, hey, of a young baby. Asleep, okay? by the way. Zero what? Asleep. No, not zero, <laughs> but just not a lot of sleep. Not enough sleep. We'll say that. So anyways, uh, Olivia's cat in the hat book was sitting on the floor, and I picked it up and there was, I just started reading it. Why not? Cat and that, great story. Just started reading hey, it. Just, just Tara and I, Dr. just Dr. reading Seuss. to my wife, you know, doing husband things. And we got to this page and this page is very intense. And I tried to read it super fast to be funny. Well, then Tara took the book from me and she tried to read it faster because Tara is very competitive. If you didn't know that. I grabbed it, started reading it faster. Then we had the phone out and we were timing each other. This is a true story. Seeing who could read it faster and, and the most clearly. All right. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. Right, you go first. Now, I am going to go first. So I have practiced, technically. Sorry. Cheating. You have not. That's not cheating. Just uh, strategy. Okay? Um, you should be reading Cat in the Hat every day, Sam. 
Come on. I don't even think I have that. This isn't even like a sponsored ad by Cat in the Hat, but it should be. Shout out to Dr. Seuss. Demonetized, he's a, he, okay. He's a, he's a legend. Anyways, I'm going to turn to the page. Um, do you have a phone on you? No, you don't. I can get, I can get mine. I can get mine. Dude, don't worry about it. Ready? Let me get my stopwatch up. I'm going to time myself. Let's Actually, I'm gonna have you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna have gotta you stay do it. six feet apart. You know what I'm six feet. I'm gonna slide it to you. I'm gonna grab that reach. All right, so let's go stopwatch. Perfect. All right, are you ready? Yeah. Six feet slide. Okay. Right. So let me turn to the page, and uh, I am pretty proud of how fast I can do this. But I just want to see if Sam can read it faster than me. I don't think he can. Just saying. Okay. I, I really hope Tara is watching okay, this right now because this this Three. game. Whoa, whoa, hey, whoa, hold on, dude. Wow, cheater. Okay. <clears throat> are you ready? Three. Yep. Two. One. Go. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Now it's fun to have fun, but you have to know how I can hold up a cup and the milk and the cake. I can hold up these books and the fish on the rake. I can hold a toy ship and a little toy man and look with my tail. I can hold a red fan. I can fan with a fan as I hop on the ball, but that isn't all. No, that isn't all. 10.76, people. Yes, Beat that. Come on. Thank you. Dude, Brandon raps, okay? That is so much proof that I'm doing a good job. Hey, six feet, dude. Come on. All right. Reset. Do you think you can beat 10.76? I mean, maybe. Hey, but it has to, you have to be clear, okay? I think I did a pretty good job being clear. I had like Which maybe one mess up. Number? I folded the page. I folded, you, no, keep, you know, it's folded. That, that's called a book. It's just, I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. That. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, are you on the right one? All right, are you ready? <clears throat> Yo, one I'll time. count you down. You got, you got to read it. Hey, I it's because I have a baby. It's fine. All right, you ready? Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Look at me, look at me, look at me now. It's fun to have fun, but you don't know how can hold the cup of me. <laughs> All right, can you start? Did, it, did anybody hear that? That was, uh, didn't beat me. I'm just saying. I just want to let you know pretty clear. You didn't win. All right, you ready? All right. Sorry, Sam and I, are, we're cool. We're friends. It's, hey, yeah, it's yeah, friendly. Yeah, yeah. All right, you ready? Well, we already know if we race that Mikey's getting smoked. So. Okay, here we go. If we foot race, yes, exactly. you would absolutely beat me in a foot race. But boy, got the wheels on. Clearly. Okay, all right. Let's go. Ready? Are you ready? Not meant to run. No, they're those not. I don't, I, don't, run. I don't run unless it's away from things or to something I like, like <laughs> ice cream. All right, here we go. Ready? <laughs> Three, two, one, go. Look at me, look at me, look at me now. It's hot. <laughs> My reading comprehension skills are not on. on the chart right do you, now. Do you, Brandon, do you hear the excuses? Do, we have Brandon do you hear the excuses? Bro, give me that book. Here, let's trade. Six feet. I'm about to beat that. 10.76. I'm going to beat myself. Since you don't want to compete. All right, down. here we go. Upside down. Sorry. Do it like flip the book over. Bro, flip the book upside yes. down. No. Yeah, All right, here bro. we go. You ready? You ready? Here we go. Right. <clears throat> It'd be like saying you're playing something in basketball and you lose, and you're like, hey, you need to play behind your back only. Exactly. That doesn't make sense. All right, here that we go. Ready? <clears throat> here we go. Ready? Set, go. Look at me, look at me, look at me now. It's fun to have fun, but you have to know how I can hold up a cup and the milk and the cake, and I can hold up these books and a fish on a rake. I can hold a ship and a little toy man, and look at my tail. I can hold up a fan with a fan. I can fan as I hop on the ball, but that isn't all. No, that isn't all. I remain. 9.7. Can Man's we get some bars. hype in the chat? Slide me on my phone. Six feet. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I think it's pretty safe to say that I soundly beat you. Bruh, all think, right? I think what we can say but, is um, I'm going to be back like next month. I'm going to come back, coming back strong. I picked the game. Mikey's going Wait, down. Hold on. I, I plan these games. All right. Anyways, hey. Sam, great job. You know what? We're still going to give you a gift as like a going away present. Bro, this is a very valuable, one of a kind, uh, Revive 2020 extra box that we had left, hey, left over. Bro, Listen, full of supplies for, for Revive. For all of you that, that didn't watch happened. Revive 2020, you need to go on YouTube. Go to at community students and rewatch all five sessions and every single elective. There you go. Thank you. Everyone give it up for Sam in the chat. Thank you so much for helping us. That was awesome. You lost. Just wanted to say it one more time. So sorry. Um, what we're going to do now is go into our time of worship. Now, here's the thing. We want you guys to be engaged as possible throughout the week. Um, please make sure tomorrow that you're staying tuned um, on our Instagram account. We post our schedule and our daily devos. And if you do those things and all the stuff that we're doing, it's going to help you stay engaged with us and stay engaged with God to the, to the best of your ability. We're going to go into our time of worship right now. Um, so wherever you are, find a place where you're not going to be distracted, where you can sing fully to God. Maybe you're actually singing out loud. Hopefully you are. Maybe you can stand, you can kneel, whatever you need to do. Get yourself in a place to worship God fully in this moment. I'm going to pray for us, and then we have some awesome friends that are going to lead us in our worship today. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we are so grateful that we have an opportunity to worship you. God, we thank you for the, the people who are in the band today. God, they're giving up their time to lead us in worship. God, I pray that as they lead us, that we would respond in a way that we are singing, truly singing praises to the God of the universe who hears us, who loves us, who knows us in this moment. 
God, we're so grateful that we have this opportunity right now to remove distractions. God, I pray that you you would remove anything that gets in between us and this moment of worship right now. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. And everyone said in the chat section, amen. Let's sing together. In 
the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah.
how faithful our God is as we sing this last song. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. Won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. In fact, can we go ahead right now in the chat section and just thank the band, thank those who are on cameras, running sound, running lights. It, it's because of them that we're able to have this experience that we do. And, and what an awesome time of worship. And uh, we're going to see that in the weeks to come as well, which I'm so excited about. And, and again, it's our goal that we would still be able to connect even though we're still online. We know that God is still working. He's still moving. We saw it with Revive, and now we want to see that every single week uh, down the road and in the future. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go into our lesson time with my good friend, Alex Weirdo. We're in the middle of a series called Youth Ministry because youth ministry is your ministry, right? This whole series, we're talking about um, the, the book of First Timothy. And we're talking about how even though you guys are, are young, you still have a ministry within the world around you, the people you interact with, the friends that you talk to, that is your ministry. All right, so as we jump into this series called Youth Ministry, again, um, grab your Bible, grab a pen, grab something to write on to take some awesome notes. Um, so I'm gonna throw it on over to my friend Alex for our lesson time today.
Well, what is up everyone? Happy Sunday. I hope you are doing well. Uh, man, isn't this awesome, right? Like worship uh, was great. Thank you so much, worship team. So appreciate that. So cool to see some of you guys back on stage. We've got our message right now. And then in a few moments, we're going to go to our life groups. Okay, if you don't have a life group, we'll explain what to do here in a few moments. For those of you guys that do have a life group, make sure you go, right? Like that is the most important thing that we do. But today we are continuing on in our group of lessons called Youth Ministry. Youth Ministry and the whole kind of premise of this series is it's a study of, of the book of 1 Timothy. Because first in 1 Timothy, we've got this, this traveling church planner named Paul. And he goes and he helps start this church in the city of Ephesus. And he puts this young guy named Timothy in charge of the church. And as time goes on, some problems start to develop. There are some things going on in the church that, that Paul hears about. And he's like, Timothy, you've got to get a hold of your church. You've got to take hold of that church. And, and you've got to do ministry in this certain way. And Timothy, people think that at the most he's 30. A lot of times people would say like, man, he's a little bit younger than that. But the whole idea is that here's a young guy doing ministry. And even at a young age, Timothy leads a church of hundreds, if not thousands of believers into knowing Christ. And guys, it must have been a crazy task. It must have been a scary task because of his age. I mean, he was leading people older than him to Jesus. But here's what we want you to know. We believe the same thing can happen with you, that even though you might be young, even though you might not be in college or graduated outside of that, you can still do ministry right where you are. You can lead people to Christ. You can teach people about God's word. You just have to be intentional in doing acts of ministry. And remember, we said ministry is defined as anything that helps build God's kingdom. Ministry is any intentional act that helps build God's kingdom. It could be a text message. It could be maybe a phone call where you're just praying with someone. It could be maybe referring someone to a song that, that spoke to you or something like that. Like it's just any intentional act that helps build the kingdom of God. And we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 3 today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. But in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to see this idea that's so true that in ministry, okay, in serving God, God cares more about who you are than what you do. God cares more about who you are than what you do. And so from the very beginning today, I want you to understand this thought. That as we go into serving people, as we go into building God's kingdom, we must go with the right identity, the right purpose, and the right heart. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, this is what it says. It says, Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy and full of respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Who you are is so much more important than what you do. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. Who you are is so much more important than what you do. I'm going to pray and then we're going to talk about how who we are matters so much when it comes to ministry. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for everything that you've given us. Uh, God, I just pray right now as we, as we gather around your word, Father, that you would speak to us. You would remind us of how good you are. God, you would convict us, Father, where we need to be convicted. Lord, we want your spirit to speak truth to us in these moments. God, we love you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Everyone said, amen. Amen. So again, we're titling this sermon series, Youth Ministry. And in this group of lessons, 
Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Hey, buddy, you got to get your church in order. Your church is struggling. The ministry in the city of Ephesus is not going well. People aren't hearing about the message of Christ in a healthy way. And so, Timothy, you've got to set people straight. And so that's why in chapter 1, Paul writes to Timothy. He says, Timothy, listen, you've got to get people's beliefs centered on Jesus. It's not about the myths. It's not about the genealogies. Right? It's always and only about Jesus. But then also, Timothy, and this is where chapter 2 comes in, you've got to teach people to pray. You've got to be a group of people that understands that the language of ministry is prayer. And how we connect to God is always through communicating with Him. Scripture brings information, but prayer brings inspiration. And so, Timothy, you've got to teach people to pray. And also, you've got to remind them it's not about them. Right? These, these people who are making church about them and how they dress and how cool they are. Like, it's not about that. And so the first two chapters in the book of 1 Timothy that Paul writes, he's telling Timothy, listen, Timothy, here is what you do in ministry. But Paul saves chapter 3 for addressing who we are in ministry. Guys, I'm going to say this a lot today, but I believe it's so important that God cares so much more about who you are than what you do. Because here's what I know. You can do the actions, but have the wrong heart, and God won't use it. But guys, if you do the correct actions with the correct heart in line with the Father, man, that is when serious ministry takes place place. And so guys, today what I want to do is I want to tell you exactly who we are supposed to be in ministry. If we want to help build God's kingdom, what are some characteristics or attributes that we need to have inside of us that will enable us to go and be effective in building the kingdom of God. Now, I've got a little disclaimer. This passage of scripture is specifically talking about people who will be leading a church. This would be people like pastors or elders. Um, this would be people who are maybe in a paid position, like myself or Mikey or, or Jonathan. This would be people like the elders of our church. We have elders and people that kind of help make major decisions. But also these qualifications are good for anybody who hopes to make an impact on the kingdom of God. And so even though you might be sitting there and you might not be like, hey, I'm not a pastor. Here is what I know. That scripture in the book of 1 Peter says that we are a part of a royal priesthood. And in other words, we don't need to go to the high priest to get them to pray for us. No, no, no. Every single person has access to God. Therefore, every single person can be a communicator of God. If you believe that, would you just type amen in the chat for me? We are all able to communicate and do ministry with the word of God because we have access to God through the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do is I want to share some characteristics that will help us be effective in ministry. But before we even go and do ministry, we've got to be the right person. So what Paul tells Timothy is he says, listen, Timothy, your church And it's not full of the right people. And Timothy, if you want to see your city reached for Christ, you've got to see your church filled with the right people. And so here is who the Christian leaders are supposed to be. Paul says this in verse 1. He says, Whoever aspires to be an overseer or a leader or a pastor desires a noble task. In other words, it's good, right? It's a good thing for someone to want to step up and go into leadership. Verse 2, now the overseer or the leader or the pastor is to be above reproach. This is one of those characteristics that I want to stop and talk about for a second because this whole idea of being above reproach literally means that people will have nothing to hold on to. They won't have any any history of of mistakes or anger or uh, yelling or name calling or they just can't grab at you and say, this is why you shouldn't be here. This is why you shouldn't tell me about God, right? Because, Because you did this or you said that or you were this person. And guys, let me be really honest with you. Man, every single one of us has sinned. 
Every single one of us has, has made mistakes, but here is my hope for you. From this point forward, you understand that the cost of ministry, the cost of the kingdom of God, it lays upon your shoulders and your ability to be above reproach. And quite honestly, here's what that means. It means that we as believers shouldn't do anything that's going to compromise our testimony. You know, one of the things that, that we say a lot in our faith is we say things like, I'm, I'm strong enough to handle that. It's okay, I can be around those people. They don't affect me that way. I know it's, it's not bad uh, and it might not be good, but it's okay. I, I'm okay with it. You guys, being above reproach means that we don't have any association with things that have the appearance of evil. You know, being above reproach literally means that people can't come up to us and say, hey, I know you're talking about Jesus, but I don't know if you actually believe in him based off of how you're living. I don't know if you actually believe in him based off of the words you say. I don't know if you actually believe in him based off of the things that you're listening to or the things that you're watching or the things that you joke about, right? Like this idea of being above reproach is the basis for our testimony, right? If we want people to see a life that's devoted to Jesus, we've got to have this idea of being above reproach. It's the idea of like a bike race, okay? And you've got all these people in the middle of the pack and they're running and they're racing and they're pedaling and they're pedaling. And then you've got the leader. And there's distance between the leader and the pack. And that's the idea that Paul is creating for Timothy. He's saying, listen, Timothy, as a leader in ministry, if you want to help build the kingdom of God, you've got to create distance between yourself and the things of this world so that people won't look at you. Say, man, I don't know if I want to be a Christian. They're just like everybody else. No, no, they'll look at you and say, man, that person's different. You know what one of the most sad things to me is? I actually hear this a lot. It sometimes happens where we're all talk with someone who is maybe a part of our ministry or a part of the ministries that I've been a part of, and we'll have a conversation. We'll sit down and I'll say, hey, man, like, tell me about you and God. And they'll say something to the effect of, I don't have a faith anymore. Or I don't believe in God. And I'll ask them why. And they'll say something to the effect of this believer, this friend, this parent who claimed to know Jesus acted in an unchristian way towards me. And so because of that, if that's what Christians are like, I mean, I don't want to be a part of it. Guys, I just want to encourage you today to be above reproach. Don't give Satan a foothold to work with. And maybe you would say, hey, man, I've got a past. I've made mistakes. We all have. There is forgiveness. But make that commitment today to say, you know what? Today I'm going to live my life worthy, like Ephesians says, worthy of the calling that God has placed on my life to go and make disciples. You can't make disciples if you're not a disciple of Christ yourself. Amen? So be that disciple of Jesus. Be above reproach and watch how God uses you. So Paul says to Timothy, they must be above reproach. But then he also says, they must be faithful to their wife. They must be faithful, <clears throat> excuse me, voice crack, went back to like fourth grade right there. They must be faithful to their wife. Now, you guys, right, you're not married, okay? So as we kind of read some of this, you're like, oh, well, that, that doesn't apply to me. No, no, no. Because what the, the idea that Paul is talking to Timothy about here is still applicable, especially to young people. Because he's talking about the idea of purity in our relationships, He's saying, listen, if you are married, you need to honor and respect your spouse. But even if you're not married, and this is where I, I want to take this, is you still need to have healthy boundaries in regards to your relationships with other people. That can be friends, but also that applies to dating relationships too. And guys, I think one of the areas that Satan pulls us down from being effective in ministry, especially for young people, is the area of relationships. 
He gets in all sorts of things like jealousy or gossip or, or impurity or, or actions that we shouldn't be doing or thinking or saying or sending over messages, whatever. Like, like he gets in that. But the truth is, if we want to do ministry, man, we've got to have no part of that. Our relationships should be encouraging. They should be upbeat. They should be letting people know that, man, you're their biggest cheerleader. You are on their side. You see them as someone who is loved by God, and you don't want to mess that up. You see them as someone who is a son or daughter of the king, and you are going to respect them and their wishes, and you're going to put God first and them second, right? And even when they encourage you to do something that you might not be comfortable with, if it doesn't honor God, you are not doing it. And guys, I believe if we could have that attitude, man, young people all around South Florida would see people who are different. Man, that, that person was encouraging. Man, that, that person didn't make fun of me. Man, that, that person was respectful to me in this relationship, even though we might have disagreed. That person didn't get mad. Man, that person was just so nice to talk to. Like, what's up with, like, we could change this world if we were respectful in our relationships. You know, the truth is, so many important people in Scripture have fallen because of their poor choices in relationships. There are two really big ones in Scripture that I think about. The first one is David. You know, David let, let his eyes, right, let, let what he saw dictate his actions. And in the moment he saw Bathsheba and, and they, they did some things that they definitely shouldn't have been doing. And there were consequences for that. And the reputation and the legacy of David was, was tarnished because of his sin. Did God forgive him? Absolutely. Did God restore him? Absolutely. But man, David had a choice. And he made some poor choices. But also there's Samson. And, and Samson in the same way, it wasn't a quick act like David had, it was a slow, spiritual death for Samson. And in both of these cases, in both of these situations, both of these guys knew who God was. They believed in God. But they chose relationships over the Father. Because I just want to encourage you in your relationships, like I just said a second ago, and always put God first. Always put honoring God first because, man, hear me out. One of the quickest ways to ruin your testimony, right? Your reputation for being a godly believer is through having a relationship or a friendship that is unhealthy and full of the wrong things. Whether it be gossip, whether it be, it be judgment or or poor actions, or language, or whatever, like those are some of the quickest ways that you can ruin your testimony. And when you start talking about Jesus, right, people are going to be like, no, 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 don't tell me about Jesus. You, you just did that. Like, we've got to honor God in our relationships, right? Number one, because we're dealing with someone who is created by God, and we need to treat them with respect. But also, we know that how we treat people it's a direct reflection of what we believe in God and how we believe God interacts with us. So Paul says, listen, be above reproach. Be faithful to your wife. And then he says this word. He says, be temperate. Be temperate. And this word temperate literally means to be clear-headed and not full of excess. Be clear-headed and not full of excess. And so I got to ask you real quick, is there any excess in your life? Is there anything in your life that you're like, man, I just do this way too much. You know, for me, I'll just be real honest. One of the things that, that I can enjoy in excess with is food, right? Like there, there are times where, man, I just know I eat way too much. The other day, I opened the, the freezer and, and I was like, man, where, where's my ice cream? And Stacy's like, you ate it, right? Like, I didn't even know that I had eaten that much ice cream. But excess can be something that affects our mind. And excess could be things, maybe it's food, but it could be sleep, right? Some of you guys, man, you sleep way too much. You got to get up. 
You got to enjoy the day. You got to go and spend time with God. Spend time with people. Go and, and make a difference in your world. For some of you guys, it could be video games. And video games are great, but please hear me. That is virtual reality, right? They can be a good tool to reach people for Jesus. But what I have found when I've tried to maybe reach people for Jesus over video games is that I pay way more attention to the game than I do about reaching people. And so I would just encourage you, man, have a time limit for your video games. For some of you, excess could be in social media. You spend way too much time on that phone, clicking those thumbs, trying to get the likes, or seeing what this person is doing, or seeing what that person is doing. The whole idea that Paul is getting across to Timothy is that your life should be balanced. And the top thing that holds the priority in your life should be time spent with the Father. Time spent in God's word. Time spent in worship. Time spent in prayer. And don't allow other things to throw you out of balance. So he says you've got to be above reproach, faithful, temperate. And then he throws in this word, self-controlled. Self-controlled. And what this means is it means that we should live wise lives. Wise lives. Our, our lives should not be full of foolish decisions. And guys, I think this is so important here. Because when we talk about being self-controlled, a lot of times we think about like, man, I don't want to be on like a fail video or I don't want someone to see me do something and think like, man, that person was an idiot. And that's not even really what Paul's saying here. What he's saying when he says be self-controlled is he's really addressing the words that we say and what we talk about. He's saying you need to be self-controlled in your conversations. You need to be self-controlled in, in the language that you use. You need to be self-controlled in the joking that you have. And that word self-controlled literally means sober-minded. Sober-minded. You are alert and you are vigilant. There's a scripture here in Ephesians chapter 5 that I want to read to you guys. And in verse 4, it says this. It says, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather be full of thanksgiving. When Paul says be self-controlled, he's saying, listen, guys, you've got to be aware of, yes, your actions. And we've talked about that a little so far, but you've got to be aware of what you're saying. And not just aware of what you're saying, but also how you say it. Right? Like how you say something means everything. And guys, I just want to encourage you, just like Ephesians 5 verse 4 says, don't be full of coarse joking or, or, or bad language, but be the most thankful and encouraging and uplifting person. You would be amazed. You would be amazed at how many people would want to have a conversation with you or how much influence you could gain with your friends if you would just encourage them. If you just be their cheerleader, if you just ask them like, hey, I know you had this test, how'd it go? <coughs> Excuse me. Hey, I know you had this, this sports thing, how'd you do? Hey, I heard that you were going to watch this show. What do you think? Let's talk about it. Was it good? But like, you would just be amazed at how much influence you could gain if you were just encouraging. Guys, that's what Paul's trying to get us to see, that we can literally grow the kingdom of God, not through negativity, but through encouragement. So he says, be self-controlled, <clears throat> but also be respectable. Be respectable. And this goes back to 1 Corinthians 14, 33, which says, we serve a God, not of chaos, but of order, right? God is not a God of chaos, but God is a God of peace or of order. And when Paul says to Timothy, hey, man, your leaders in the church, they've got to be respectable, what he's talking about is they've got to be disciplined. They've got to be orderly in their lives specifically. And I've said this a few times. I think Paul is making this point that they should be disciplined in putting God first, their family second, others third, and then themselves last. They should have a disciplined routine to their lives. Are there disruptions? Absolutely. I mean, coronavirus has been a huge disruption for all of us. But even in the disruptions, they are disciplined 
to make God their top priority. And then after respectable, he goes on and he says they're hospitable. That means literally they have a love for strangers. They have a love to, to people they know and people they don't know. They're, they're kind, they're friendly, they're genuine. They want to know who these people are. And guys, I promise you, if we could just take interest in people, if we could just care about who they are, if we could care about their soul and maybe where they're spending eternity, guys, I promise we would get a window to witness to them. But you know what happens? <clears throat> what happens all the time in my life, and I'll just use my life as an example, so I'll have a conversation with them and, and they'll ask me how I'm doing and I'll say I'm good or uh, I want this to eat if I'm at a restaurant or I want this to drink and, and they'll ask me how I'm doing but I never take the time to care about them. And guys, what I want you to see is the gospel compels us, the message of Jesus compels us to be the most caring group of people on this planet. We should never be in a rush. We should always take time to hear how people are doing, see what we can be praying for, figure out what's going on in their life so, so we can see how we can encourage them, right? That is the heart of hospitality. And so Paul says you need to, to be all of these things, but then he goes on and he says they've got to be able to teach. And this is the first characteristic that is external from who a person is. And guys, I want you to hear me tonight, what, 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 or today, whenever you're watching this, what, what Paul is saying here is he's saying, listen, you need to be able to at least communicate the message of Jesus to the people you're around. This doesn't mean you have to stand up on a stage or in front of a camera and do that, but you should at least be able and be comfortable to have a conversation about God. For some of you, that means that this week, your challenge is to, for the very first time ever, have a conversation about God with someone. Have a conversation with someone about your faith and what you believe and, and maybe how they're doing in and, and God or what they don't believe, all that kind of stuff. But for others of you, you know how to talk about God. This just means that this week you go and do it for the second or third or 100th time. Go and talk about God. God. And I'm going to go through a few of these pretty quickly. Um, man, they're able to teach, but then also, <clears throat> verse 3, they're not given to drunkenness. In other words, they don't um, consume alcohol in excess. You guys should not be consuming alcohol um, at all at this point. Um, you're not violent, but gentle. Um, again, the idea there is that there's no violence. Right? There's no need to have violence right now. We're, we're not at war with other people. We are in a peaceful time. And so we should be the most loving group of people. They're not quarrelsome. In other words, there are, not, there are arguments that, that keep popping up. Like, have you ever met someone who always wants to win an argument? It's like, bro, not everything's an argument, right? And that's what Paul's telling Timothy. Man, you've got to get whatever that is that wants to argue with people out of your life. They're not a lover of money. In other words, they don't think money is going to change their world. Guys, it's just stuff. All right, we talked about that last week. <clears throat> they must manage their family well. Let's talk about this for a second, okay? When Paul says, hey, they've got to manage their family well, he's specifically talking to the parents, okay? And you guys, man, you're not at that stage of your life, uh, but I do think there's some interesting truth here that we can pull out. And it's this idea that Paul says, before you go and minister to other people, before you go and, and try and help other people with their faith, make sure that your family's good. Make sure that you've done everything you can within your family to make sure your relationships are good and they're working and they're holy and they honor God. And maybe some of you guys have a parent or a family member that doesn't believe in God. That doesn't mean that they need to be converted to Christianity before you can go and share your faith. But what that does mean is that you've got to do every single thing you can to make sure there is peace in your home before you even go try and share the message of Christ, right? Go and, and make amends. Say, I'm sorry. Have that hard conversation and say, hey, man, I want to get along better. And then go and start sharing God's word. Why? Because like I said, God cares about who you are way more than what you do. And he wants you to be a person of 
peace in your home. Verse 6, uh, must not be a new believer. In other words, you've got you've to have some time where you understand Scripture. And if, if some of you guys are new believers, it's awesome. I mean, I believe God can use you right where you are. And so keep growing, keep learning, ask questions. Verse 7, he must have a good reputation with outsiders. And guys, this is where I'm going to close today. Because when Paul says to Timothy, listen, if you want to witness to other people, if you want your testimony to be heard, your story and faith, if you want it to be heard, you've got to have a good reputation with outsiders. I want you to imagine that these blocks represent some of the things we've talked about. These represent your story. These blocks represent your, your ability to be above reproach. These, these blocks represent you being faithful in your relationships, temperate, self-controlled, um, respectable, um, not violent. Uh, let's see here. Uh, hospitable. These represent you not loving money, right? Like, like this is the entire testimony that you have, okay? And this is what you're going to bring before lost people. It's the totality of your walk with God. And lost people are going to look at that and they're going to be like, man, th that person seems like they've, they've got it all together. Let, let, let me test them a little bit. No, I, I, think, I think that person's strong. Th their life, their testimony is intact. It's in order. Their witness is strong. And I can trust what they say. But guys, I think if we're honest, as we read this list, and I'm going to read it again, okay? We are tempted right now to read this and say, okay, uh, I need to be above reproach, okay? Uh, I need to have healthy relationships. Uh, well, I can't do that. Uh, I need to be temperate, okay? Uh, I need to be self-controlled and, and not make coarse joking. Uh, I, I, I can't do that. Oh, okay, I need to, uh, I need to be uh, respectable. Okay, I, I can try. And I, I need to be hospitable and welcome to other people. Well, what if I don't like other people? I can't, I can't do that. But then also, I, I need to, to be able to teach. Okay, I can teach, I can talk, but, but not given to drunkenness. Well, what if I, I like that? Or what if it makes me feel like I, I can't do that? And so, guys, what happens in faith is a lot of times we present an incomplete picture of our testimony to lost people. And we say things like, hey, follow me. Come follow Jesus. Let me show you. And when we're tested, when we are tempted, and people who are lost see us in our struggles, this is what happens to our testimony. It literally falls down. Guys, I think this is such an important message for us to hear today. Because what Paul is telling Timothy is he's saying, listen, Timothy, before you go and share the message of Jesus and do ministry and focus on who you are, be someone who is respectable, hospitable, loves other people, wants to teach, wants to be a leader, Someone who is self-controlled. Someone who is temperate. Someone who, who doesn't love money, right? And someone who desires to see other people have a love for God. Timothy, be this person. Don't worry about doing just yet. But be this person because, guys, when the testing comes, and you will be able to stand. So here's the question today. How are you doing with this stuff? And how, how are you doing with some of the care of your soul? Are you self-controlled? Are you respectable? Are you disciplined in your faith? Are you, are you honoring God in your relationships? Guys, please <clears throat> hear me. You have an opportunity today to get right with God, to start working on these things so that your testimony and your ministry can be effective as you go out. Guys, God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. If you've struggled in this area, you can always ask for forgiveness. And it's my hope and my challenge that before you go out and do ministry, you work on who you are today.
Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for everything that you've given us. Lord, I pray that these students would just remember this idea that God, who they are is so much more important than what they do. God, you love them. You sent your son to die for them. And God, you want to encourage them to do ministry. But Father, I pray that right now, today, as we get ready to go into groups, they would understand that God, you are calling them back to you if they have walked away, if they have strayed. And Father, for those who are doing well, I just pray that they would be encouraged to keep following you. We love you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Everyone said, amen. Thanks, guys. Alex, thank you so much for that awesome lesson talking about youth ministry again. And it's our goal, it's our hope that you guys would see and know the ministry that is happening right around you with your family, with your friends, and even in your own neighborhoods right now that you can be a part of. What we're going to do right now is send you guys to your life groups clap. Um, because we know that life groups are so important when it comes to connecting with each other. We do our life groups right now through Zoom. If you don't have the link, if you don't have the Zoom link for your specific group, there is a number down in our description that you can click on, or sorry, that you can text and say, hey, life group, and we will send you your life group information if you text that number in the description below. We want to make sure you guys get to the right group in the right place. Your group leader is going to be there to welcome you with a warm smile digitally, right? And you guys are going to go through some questions talking about the lesson we just learned from today. So go ahead and right now head on over to your life groups. You guys are awesome. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next Sunday again for an online experience. You guys are great. Peace out.